Statement, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. Secretary David Davis. Uh, with permission, Mr Speaker, I'll now make a statement on the next steps in leaving the European Union. The mandate for Britain to leave the European Union is clear, overwhelming and unbelievable. As the Prime Minister has said more than once, we will make a success of Brexit and no one, no one should seek to find ways to thwart the will of the people expressed in a referendum on the 23rd of June. It's now incumbent on the government to deliver an exit in the most orderly and smooth way possible, delivering maximum certainty for businesses and workers. I want to update the House on how the government plans to reflect UK withdrawal from the, EU, from the European Union on the statute book, whilst delivering that certainty and stability. We'll start by bringing forward a great repeal bill that will mean the European Communities Act ceasing to apply on the day we leave the European Union. It was this act that put EU law above UK law. So it's right, given the clear instruction for exit given to us by the people in the referendum, that we end the authority of European Union law. Yeah. We will return sovereignty to the institutions of this United Kingdom. That's what people voted for on June 23rd, for Britain to take control of its own destiny and for all decisions about taxpayers' money, borders and laws to be taken here in Britain. The referendum was backed by six to one in this House, and on all sides of the argument, leave and remain, we have a duty to respect and carry out the people's instruction. Now, as I said, the mandate is clear, and we will reject any attempt to undo the referendum result, any attempt to hold up the process unduly, or any attempt to keep Britain in the EU by the back door by those who didn't like the answer they were given on June 23rd. We are consulting widely with business and Parliament and we want to hear and take account of all views and opinions. The Prime Minister has been clear. We won't be giving a running commentary because that's not the way to get the right deal for Britain. Yeah, yeah. But we are committed to providing clarity where we can as part of this consultative approach. Naturally, I want this House to be engaged throughout and we will observe the constitutional and legal precedents that apply to any new treaty uh, on a new relationship with the European Union. Indeed, my whole approach is about empowering this place. <laughs> Think about it. The Great, Repeal Act will, the Great Repeal Act will convert existing European, European Union law into domestic law, wherever practical. That will provide for a calm and orderly exit and give as much certainty to employers, investors, consumers and workers. And we have been clear. UK employment law already goes further than European Union law in many areas and this government will do nothing to undermine those rights in the workplace. There is, I see we've got no cheer for that from the Labour benches. That's a, there, is, there, is, there is over 40 years... There is over 40 years of European Union law in the UK law to consider in all, and some of it simply won't work on exit. We must act to ensure there is no black hole in our statute book. Then it will be for this House, this House, to consider the changes to our domestic legislation to reflect the outcome of our negotiation and our exit, subject to international treaties and agreements with other countries and with the EU on matters such as trade. Mr Speaker, the European Communities Act has meant that if there is a clash between an act of the UK Parliament and EU law, it's the European Union law that prevails. As a result, we have to abide by judgments delivered by the European Court of Justice in their interpretation of European Union law. The Great Repeal Bill would change that with effect on the day we leave the European Union. And Mr Speaker, legislation resulting from the UK's exit must work for the whole of the United Kingdom. To that end, while no one part of the UK can have a veto over our exit, the Government will consult with the devolved administrations. I have already held initial conversations with the leaders of the devolved governments about our plans, and I will make sure the devolved administrations have every opportunity to work closely with us. Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear. This bill, this bill is a separate issue to when Article 50 is triggered. The Great Repeal Bill is not what will take us out of the EU, 
but what will ensure the UK statute book is fit for purpose after we have left and put the elected politicians in this country fully in control of determining laws that affect its people's lives, something that does not apply today. In order to leave the EU, we will follow the process set out in Article 50 of the European Union Treaty. The Prime Minister will invoke Article 50 no later than the end of March next year. That gives us the space required to do the necessary work to shape our negotiating strategy. The House will understand this is a very extensive and detailed programme of work which will take some time. The clarity, the, clarity, the clarity on the timing of our proposed exit also gives the European Union the time needed to prepare its position for the negotiation. The President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, said the Prime Minister had brought, and I quote, welcome certainty the timing of the Brexit talks. And we will, as Britain always should, abide by our treaty obligations not tearing up EU law unilaterally, as some have suggested, but ensuring stability and certainty as Britain takes control on the day of exit and not before. People have asked what our plan is for exit. This is the first stage. To be prepared for an orderly exit, there is a need to move forward on domestic legislation in parallel with our European negotiation so that we are ready for the day of our withdrawal when the process set out in Article 50 concludes. Therefore, I can tell the House that we intend to introduce the Great Repeal Bill in the next parliamentary session. It demonstrates the Government's determination to deliver the will of the people, expressed in the European Union referendum result, that Britain should once again make its own laws for its own people. Yes. Mr Speaker, it is nations that are outward-looking, enterprising and agile that will prosper in an age of globalisation. I believe that when we have left the European Union, when we are once again in true control of our own affairs, we will be in an even stronger position to confront the challenges of the future. Yeah. The Government will build a global Britain that will trade around the world, build new alliances with other countries and deliver prosperity for its people. Yeah. 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 Sir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Secretary of State's statement and thank him for advance notice. Uh, of it. The decision the Government takes over the next few months and years on exiting the EU will define us uh, for a generation, so I look forward to seeing the Secretary of State regularly at the dispatch box. Um, But I have to say, he's not making a very good start. His first statement of the 5th of September was widely criticised for saying nothing. And this one's not much better. When I first read it, I actually thought it was the statement he had given last time. (laughs) A bit of process, no substance, but I congratulate him on a bit of humour in the phrase, quotes, we are committed to providing clarity where we can. (laughs) Mr Speaker, during the referendum campaign, much was made of the Leave side about parliamentary sovereignty. In his statement, the Secretary of State says, we will return sovereignty to the institutions of this United Kingdom. Yet it seems that the Government wants to draw up negotiating terms, negotiate and reach a deal without any parliamentary approval. That is not making Parliament sovereign. That is sidelining Parliament. Uh, and that is why Labour is calling for a vote on the basic terms proposed by the Government before Article 50 is invoked. Yeah. Some argue that this, will, this is a device to frustrate the process. It is nothing of the sort. Yeah. It is making sure that we get the best possible deal for Britain. It is making sure that the Government actually has a plan. It is basic accountability on some of the most important decisions of our lifetime. Yeah. And let's remind ourselves, the Government had no plan for Brexit in its 2015 manifesto. In fact, they had a manifesto commitment to, I quote, safeguard British interests in the single market. Whitehall famously made no plans for the Leave vote, and the Prime Minister did not explain her plans for Brexit before assuming office. Now the Government plans to proceed to an exit deal without a vote in this House. That is wholly unacceptable in any democracy. So I ask ask the Secretary of State, if there is to be no vote 
uh, when the terms of negotiation are agreed, at what stage in the process does he propose that the basic terms of the Article 50 negotiations, of which he said nothing today, should be debated and voted for in this House? The Secretary of State makes much about the Great Repeal Bill. So we're having a conversation now, a debate now, about what happens at the very end of the process instead of a debate about what's happening at the beginning of the process. But that bill will not provide parliamentary scrutiny of Article 50 negotiating plans. It's about what happens after exit. And can he confirm that the vote on the Great Repeal Bill will be after and not before Article 50 is invoked next March? Now, we do accept and respect the result of the referendum. But, but neither those who voted to remain nor those who voted to leave gave the government a mandate to take an axe to our economy. Throughout the process, the national interest must come first. Yet, by flirting with hard Brexit, the Prime Minister puts at risk Britain's access to the single market rather than doing the right thing for jobs, for business and for working people in this country. In fact, I observe the words single market do not appear at all in the statement today. So much for putting the national interest first. So we need clarity and we need answers. Can the Secretary of State assure the House today that the Government will seek continued access to the single market on the best possible terms? Uh, And will he also assure the House that his Government will lend the divisive and hostile tone of Brexit discussions in recent weeks? This is a defining issue of this Parliament and quite probably for Parliaments to come. The job of any responsible Government is now to bring the country together, not to drive them apart. And I hope that is the approach that he will take. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. Well, I will start by welcoming the... uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman to the dispatch box. Uh, it's a pleasure to appear opposite him. Uh, but I would start also by really rereading to him a warning from his own Shadow Home Secretary, who said about his comments, we have to be really careful that we're not seen to be not listening. Uh, there will be scrutiny, but it is, I think, not helpful to pretend we can reverse the result. That's a summary from inside his own party, which, uh, which doesn't really support where he's coming from. Now, let's, let's talk about... He's a, he's, a lawyer by, he's a lawyer by training and, and career as well. Article 50 is a prerogative power. It's a prerogative power because, of, uh, in the view of all the lawyers that we have spoken to, it's a prerogative power in the view of the Attorney-General, who will be presenting the case in court uh, in the coming week, uh, and it, is, it will be decided in court. They decided in court, which he ought to take seriously. Now, as for his comments to date in terms of the parliamentary accountability, I have to say my department has been effectively in existence since the middle of the summer. In the two weeks of parliamentary session we've had since then, we've had two statements, a couple of debates. Uh, We've got a debate on Wednesday, his own debate. Uh, We're announcing very early a major piece of legislation. Successor legislation to that bill will take place as well. There'll be a new select committee uh, set up to oversee the department. There'll be numerous debates over the next two years, numerous debates over the next uh, two years. At the end of the process, we'll follow each each and every legal and constitutional convention and requirement applied to all European legislation and European treaties. So I cannot see how he thinks that that is, in some sense, not accountable. But the Parliament, the Parliament then, after that, will be able to amend all European U- U- Union law which he was unable to do before, of course, which fact he he sort of overlooks in his accountability. I'm afraid the Honourable Gentleman really has to understand the distinction between accountability, and I have a little bit of experience in holding governments to account, uh, difference uh, between accountability and micromanagement, which is what he is trying to do. Now, we have made actually pretty plain what our view on the negotiation is. We said very clearly... We want to control borders. Does he agree with that? I mean, he can nod or shake his head. He wants to control borders. He's absolutely stationary. No sign. We want to control our laws. Does he agree with that? No sign. Uh, We want 
We want, we want the most open, barrier-free access to the European market. Full stop. That's very clear. The Honourable Lady is shouting, what about our economy? That's the answer. Exactly. We want the mo most open, barrier-free access to the European market. We've heard lots and lots of very um, unhelpful, uh, misleading comments, frankly, on hard Brexit and soft Brexit. What we want are the best possible access terms, full stop. Best terms, that's it. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. May I uh, congratulate my right honourable friend on his statement, and may I urge him to resist the temptation of advice from a second-rate lawyer who doesn't even understand the parliamentary process. Can I, uh, can I point out to him? Can I point out to him that uh, if he is to advise his opposite number, he might remind him that the repeal of the 72 European Communities Act will give many, many opportunities to amend and debate every single aspect of the discussions around the invoking of Article 50. And just in case they hadn't noticed, they also have the device of opposition days, when they can debate absolutely anything they choose, even the whole issue of the European Union. So may I urge him to get on with the process and don't listen to those who really want to bog it down and never let it happen. With the mild exception of his rudeness about the Honourable Gentleman's legal qualifications, I agree with everything he said. The simple truth is that the attempt to block Article 50 is an attempt to block the will of the British people. Full stop. There will be plenty of opportunity to debate in the next two and a half years in the Act, in the successor legislation and in any number of debates between now and then. Stephen Giffins. Uh, can I also thank the Secretary of State for coming to the House to try and update us today. Um, can I wish the Secretary of State all the best for this afternoon in managing to get through this statement without getting into trouble from his boss, yeah. the Prime Minister, this time? He seems to be aiming to do that by not telling us anything. So, Mr Speaker, we may be no clearer on if this is a soft Brexit or a hard Brexit. We do know that it's a dog's Brexit. Yeah. And I'll be frank, this government's frankly irresponsible, irresponsible failure to provide any details about their plans are having an impact beyond this place. The Fraser Valder Institute in Scotland reckon that in Scotland alone this could have an impact between 30 and 80,000 80, jobs due to your plans to take us out of the European Union. So will they tell us today, my first question, what plans does he have to formally involve the devolved administrations? I notice that he talked about involving the devolved administrations previously. He now talks about consulting with the devolved administrations. The government provides us no answers. I'm going to try and make it easy for the, the Secretary of State. He has had 89 days since he took up post, three months on Thursday, Secretary of State. To stop him getting into any more trouble with the Prime Minister, I'm going to make the next question very, very simple. Does he agree with page 72 of the Conservative Party manifesto on which he was elected that said that, said that it should be yes to the single market? In fact, Mr Speaker, I'll make it easier. Is it his objective to keep the United Kingdom in the single market? Well, that was longer on length than it was on content. Let me answer both, both, of, his, both, of, his, uh, both of his comments. He, he, intimated, he, intima he intimated that we were not going to involve the, uh, the devolved administrations. That is not the case, as his own leader in Scotland will tell him. Uh, indeed, she was called before we announced the Great Repeal Act in order to make sure she was aware of it. And she said she thought it was, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but something like uh, very straightforward, of common sense, or something of that nature. Now, in terms of the uh, approach to the negotiation, I'm not going to go into the details, but what I will say this is very clear. The objectives are simple. Meet the instruction from the British people, which means regain control of our borders, regain control of our, of our laws, regain, regain control of our money, and at the same time get the best possible access to the European market that we can negotiate. End of story. It's very simple. 
John Redwood. Mr. Speaker, by definition, you can't negotiate over taking back control. You have to take back control, and that is what we voted for. So I find Secretary of State's view very clear and very refreshing. And will you agree with me that the way to deal with the trade issue is to offer our partners that we carry on trading tariff free on the same basis as at present and challenge them to say how they want to wreck it? Well, he's, he's right. We want them to, to uh, operate tariff free. But it isn't, I will say to him, it isn't just simply tariff barriers. We also have to negotiate non-tariff barriers. But central to the argument he makes is this. It is in both Europe's interest and our interest to have tariff-free and non-tariff barrier-based trade. That's where the jobs are. The Honourable Gentleman for, 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 Scotland, for the Scottish seat uh, was raising the question of uh, jobs in Scotland. It's jobs in the whole United Kingdom that we have to maintain and expand and create opportunities for. And that's precisely what we'll do. Mr Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker there is clearly a mandate for Brexit from this referendum, but there is no mandate for the particular form of Brexit. Now, now, three days before he was appointed, the Secretary of State published an article saying it was very important to publish a pre-negotiation -re -pre white paper. Can he tell us when is he going to publish that white paper? Absolutely. And as someone who for many years railed about the importance of the powers of backbenchers yeah, yeah, and parliament yeah, yeah, against yeah, the executive, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can he give us now, with a straight face, an answer to the question, where is the government's mandate for its negotiations, either from this House or the country? Yeah. Well, let's, let's deal with the last one first. I really cannot believe my ears. You know, here, we, here, we have, here we have the largest mandate this country has ever given to a government on any subject in our history. It's very plain. It's very plain. Now, in terms, I, I, frankly, I will not take lectures from him on accountability either. We have two things to balance here. One is the national interest in terms of getting the right negotiation. I know of no negotiation in history, either in commerce or in politics or in international affairs, where telling everybody what you are going to do in precise detail before you do so leads to a successful outcome. So what I have said to two select committees of this House and the other House uh, already, and indeed I said in the last statement, is this. We will be as open as we can be. There will be plenty of debates on this matter. What we will not do is lay out a detailed strategy and a detailed set of tactics before we engage with our uh, opposite numbers in the negotiation. Anna Subri. Speaker. Can we make it very clear that like everybody on these benches, I was elected on a very clear manifesto promise to respect and honour the referendum result. So we know that we will leave the European <laughs> Union. But the comments of the Director General of the CBI should cause us all much concern. She has confirmed the, the fears of many on these benches that there is a danger that this government is appearing to be turning its back on the single market and not valuing the real benefit of migrant workers. Can my right honourable friend now give those assurances to British business that we haven't turned our back on the single market and we welcome migrant workers to this country? The Honourable Lady was, if I remember correctly, at the Conservative Party conference, and she may have heard what I said there. Uh, well, two things which relate to this. One is the single market, of course, is one description of the way the European Union operates, but there are plenty of people who have access to the single market, access, uh, some of them tariff-free, who make a great success of that access. And it's the success we are aiming for, the success we are aiming for. Now, the other point I made there was that the global competition for talent is something that we must engage in. If we are going to win uh, the global competition in economic terms, we must engage in the global competition for talent. We are entirely determined to do that. But that does not mean, and it is not the same as, having no control of immigration. They are very different issues. So we will be going for global talent, and we will be going for the best market access we can obtain. Yeah. Mr Nick Clegg. 
I've been a great admirer of the Secretary of State for his staunch defence of civil liberties, his staunch defence of the prerogatives of this House. I was a great admirer when he tabled moved the bill on parliamentary control of the executive in 1999, where he stirringly told us that executive decisions by the government should be subject to the scrutiny and approval of Parliament. So could he tell us... On the basis of what constitutional principle does he believe that the Prime Minister can now arrogate to herself the exclusive right to interpret what Brexit means, impose it upon the country, rather than protect the rightful role of scrutiny and approval of this House? Here we go again. We cannot tell the difference between accountability and micromanagement. It really is as simple as that. The, the, the The simple truth is that there will be debates galore in this House, starting on Wednesday and thereafter, about what the government's strategy will be, and we will tell them as much as we can, but not enough to compromise compromise the negotiation. And at every turn, right through to the end, we will obey the conventions and laws that apply to the uh, creation and indeed the uh, removal and the reform of treaties. Every single one. This is a government that behaves and believes in the rule of law, and that's how we will behave. Sir William Cash. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Has my right hon. Friend observed that uh, some seem to have forgotten that the Referendum Act gave the right to this Parliament to make the decision in the Referendum Act 2015, that furthermore the sovereignty of the people was given the opportunity to make that decision on the occasion of the referendum itself, and furthermore that as regards the question of the repeal bill, the sovereignty of Parliament will be maintained because it will be decided in this House and all the procedures relating to Article 50 are government prerogative and not subject to the decision of Parliament itself at this stage. My 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 honourable friend is exactly right. He will remember, of course, that that referendum bill was carried in this House by six to one, a six to one majority, including the vast majority of the people on the other side of the chamber. Uh, He also, because he's a constitutional lawyer, will understand better than anybody else that Crown prerogative rests on the will of the people. That's the theoretical underpinning of it. And there is no exercise of Crown prerogative in history, in history, which is better underpinned by the will of the people than this particular exercise. Angela Eagle. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr Speaker. It's the first time I've heard parliamentary sovereignty ever referred to as micromanagement. <laughs> In the past few weeks, we've seen many hundreds of thousands of foreign nationals working here questioning the welcome that they receive in this country and their future in this country. And we know that many UK citizens living and working abroad in Europe are going through a similar turmoil. We've heard now that the Foreign Office has told uh, told the LSE that it cannot involve foreign nationals in the work of Brexit as part of a contract. Will he condemn that? And will he now reassure those UK citizens living abroad and EU citizens living and working here that they are welcome in this country and reassure this Parliament that however the Brexit negotiations go, uh, the current arrangements will be maintained. I will say to the Honourable Lady, because I am sure she would not willingly um, give the House information that is not right, is that the supposed um, decision or uh, comment from the Foreign Office is simply not true. Uh, and that's, I'm assured that by the Foreign Secretary sitting next to me, and I think the LSE have also said so. And the LSE have also said so. So I think, I think it's, you know, that I, 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 say that, I, say this, I say this at the beginning of my, my comments, because the other point she had to make was an extremely serious one. Uh, and it's one, again, which I, I raised last week. Uh, and I have to say to her two things. I mean, firstly, not about the, the legal status, but about the attitude of some people post the referendum in terms of the encouragement of hatred and so on. I condemn that unreservedly, and I think everybody in this House would condemn that uh, whipping up of hatred unreservedly. 
Now, in terms of in terms of the in terms of the individuals the individuals who are European migrants here and British citizens abroad, uh, my intention and the intention of the government is to do everything possible to uh, underwrite their position, to guarantee their position, at the same time as we underwrite the, the similar position of British migrants abroad. Uh, and that's what we intend to do. I, I am as sure as... Uh, as the, I, I have a when shouted from the front bench, so I will answer it. As soon as, the answer is as soon as I can get that negotiation concluded with the European Union. Full stop. Uh, and so I don't think people should uh, worry people unnecessarily, get people concerned. I mean, bear in mind, five out of six migrants who already have already got either have or will have ILR by the time indefinitely to remain by the time we, we depart the Union. So it's a very important question. I take it very seriously, uh, and I am determined that we get an outcome which is successful for everybody. Mr. Peter Lilly, right honourable friend, notes the comments of the of President Hollande that the United Kingdom should be made to pay a price for leaving the UK, presumably by having tariffs imposed on our trade with them. <coughs> and did he respond to the president? that clearly the President feels in the absence of such punishment, leaving the EU would leave the UK manifestly better off, <laughs> and that such punishment would fall primarily on French exporters, since they export far more to us, whereas our exporters are benefiting from a 14% improvement in their competitiveness, three times the likely tariffs on average that will be imposed on them. Well, my, my right honourable friend and, and, and previous uh, erstwhile trade secretary, if I remember correctly, um, is exactly right. The damage done by a supposed punishment strategy would be primarily to the industries and the farmers on the continent who export to this country. And uh, I'm afraid that Mr Hollander and uh, Madam Merkel and others will find that they have... Uh, pressure back from their own constituents that says this is not a good strategy pursue. Uh, we believe in this country in free trade. Free, why do we believe in free trade? Because it's beneficial to both sides. And I do not see how there is a logic in exercising a punishment strategy against one of your strongest and most loyal allies. Yeah, yeah.